the book, how we got it and how to get the most out of it. This is uh, part 14, Training in Righteousness, Living in God's Gymnasium. The text we've been looking at in recent weeks is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You have that in front of you, right? Let's uh, read it together, okay? Loud and in unison. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. And there's that series of steps, teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. And we study the first three. The three steps Paul lists in these two verses describing uh, exactly how it is that God's word becomes profitable. It is inspired, it is inerrant, but that doesn't make it automatically profitable in the lives of the people reading it. And so you have these steps. All of them are important, and so is the order in which they are presented. And by that I mean the work of the Spirit through the word, is, Paul says it's, it's profitable, it's powerful, it's effective, but it is not random, it's not accidental, it's not an automated sort of process. And so we need to know the working of the Spirit with the word so that we don't get in the way of or impede the fruitfulness of the word as we read it, as we study it. If we're investing that kind of time in the word, we, we, we need something out of it for our souls. And the fourth step in producing biblical change, it's described by Paul with that term righteousness. Training in righteousness. The word's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness. And what, what I want to do this Sunday night and next Sunday night, I want to look at that term righteousness because, because I think that that word, the fourth step in this process, and that word in general causes uh, confusion among a lot of people. It's not the subject for tonight, but just as a for instance. Uh, usually Sunday morning, Pastor Chris will read a text. I like reading God's word together in church. And for the last little while, it's been from the Psalms. He picks those. And I don't know if you've noticed, but week by week by week by week, We've seen up on those screens, we've read together as a church, um, how God honors and blesses the righteous, but the wicked he will cast off and drive away. Blessed are the righteous. Here's my question. How are Christians, how are Christians to read the Psalms where it talks about the importance of righteousness and God looking with favor upon the righteous. Talking about works of righteousness. Turning from wickedness and doing righteousness. So here's my question. Do we qualify for the righteous when we read those? Anybody got a problem here? Yeah. Yeah. So are we just pounding ourselves in the ground as we read this about how important it is to be righteous and God loving the righteous and favoring the righteous and blessing the righteous and we all know we're a bunch of sinners. That term righteous, righteousness, how shall we apply it to our lives? And so before we get into just the fourth step in this process of producing biblical change, I want to take Tonight, and I know it's Mother's Day, and I know that a lot of you had a, a massive lunch or whatever, so I've got you right on the edge of a coma right now. But I still want to, dare I, 
I still want to start unpacking this idea of how the Bible uses that term righteous, righteousness. Because it's used in three different ways in the scripture. And not the same. So, here we go, point number one. We need to make sure we understand the different ways the word righteousness is used in the scriptures. So, this will be tonight and just the very beginning of next week's. I say in the notes that the, the reason I'm doing this is, is not complex. There's, there's a basic theology of righteousness that gets processed and worked through in the scriptures. And it's because we usually don't, because it's, it's not the kind of thing that makes church people dance in the aisles, so we don't usually examine stuff like this. That question I asked you about the Psalms. I dare say, and it's not that we're not bright or anything else, it's just, that's not the kind of thing most people think of when we read the Psalms like that. The average understanding, go to the person out on the street, even if he says he's a Christian, he might not go to church all that often, even if he believes some of the basic biblical teaching on, on heaven and hell, reward, judgment, here's the understanding he has. Go up to him and ask him. Good people go to... Bad people go to, there you go. And what I want to say is that's not in the Bible anywhere. It is the common understanding. We need to know that there's a, a partial truth in that in a very limited sense. One of the reasons people in this world and very many in the church have almost no understanding of sin and the need for salvation through Jesus Christ is they have a limited grasp of that term righteous and righteousness as it's used in the Bible. Used three ways. Two of them are positive, one is negative. Tonight, the negative. The Bible talks about a kind of righteousness that can exist in our lives but doesn't get us anywhere with God. A classic text would be something like Isaiah 64, 6. And I could have piled up 20 verses. I chose three passages. Isaiah 64, 6. This is the prophet. And this is a prophet speaking to God's covenant people. All right? We have all become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds... This is not the bad things they do. This is the good things they do. Okay? All of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. Here's another passage, Romans 10, 3 and 4. 4. Being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and, a, and seeking to establish their own, that is, their own righteousness, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Paul's talking about his people, the Jewish people. He's a Jew. An Orthodox Pharisee, trained in the righteousness of the law. And isn't that interesting? People like that. In another place, he's going to say that he, according to the law, he says he was blameless. That's what he says in the book of Philippians. Blameless. Like, that's quite a claim. But ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God, seeking to establish their own righteousness. They did not submit to God's righteousness, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. He's the end of the law for righteousness. It's not the end of righteousness, and it's not the end of the law. We fulfill the law of Christ in our lives, but he is the end of the law as a tool to earn righteousness. That all comes to a close with Jesus Christ. Okay, one more, Matthew 23. Jesus talking to the religious people, the ones who keep more religious regulations than anyone else. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. 
You build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding, in shedding the blood of the prophets. And thus you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents. You brood of vipers. How do you picture Jesus talking to people sometimes? You picture Jesus walking up to a bunch of, you bunch of snakes, he says. How are you going to escape being sentenced to hell? There it is from Jesus, the H word. Now, the striking common feature of all those strong words of scripture is they're, they're directed against people who profess and in, in a certain outward state even possess a, a brand, a kind of righteousness. Probably the best passage of the three for our purposes is the Romans 10 passage. And, and Paul defines the kind of righteousness that is almost universally admired by the man on the street because it can make, it can make law enforcement easier, it can make politics simpler, it can make life in society safer, no question. The righteousness of people who want to make an approach to God, the creator, without necessarily acknowledging their need of Christ, even if they don't think of it in theological terms like that, they, they just seek to establish, establish credibility, decency before God on the basis of the fulfilling of their inner potential, religious heritage, background, culture, regulations, laws... Look at that Romans 10, 3 and 4. For being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God. And the important word would be comes from. Not, not given to, but comes from. Not the kind you present to God through your efforts, but the kind that comes from God. And seeking to establish their own. They didn't submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So, those are the two trademarks of the religion of the average man. He ignores Jesus Christ and he seeks to establish his own standard for pleasing God. Credibility before God. Decency, uprightness before God. So he, he, creates, he creates a God, not the God of the New Testament... Not the God of the unfolding revelation of the new, the promise of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus Christ. Not that God. But he creates a God who can be, who can be pleased. A God from whom you can gain favor. Maybe by tolerance. Decency. Acts of compassion. Acts of charity. Please don't think those words that I read from Romans 10 are just, you know, the kind of thing that theologians sit and think about. They encapsulate something very common in today's church. I've, I've heard it said, talking with people in this church. The people who don't worry, if they ever darken the door for worship, they love Jesus. They, they want to please God. People who couldn't list the books of the Bible... Never take the time to seek God. Maybe they're sexually immoral. You talk to them and they'll tell you how much they love God. They've, they've established their own pattern for pleasing God. They've set up their own standard, their own definition of love for Christ. And they think, they think if they say it enough and believe it enough sincerely in their heart that they will create they will create some kind of a way of pleasing God apart from devotion to and submission to Jesus Christ. And, and they never will, and it'll never work. So there's this biblical truth. It's talked about in that Romans 10 passage. We're going to look at it more in just a few minutes. That's offensive to the modern mind, the modern religious mind many times. And that is that 
God isn't obligated to accept whatever we offer him in terms of moral righteousness, being good people, living up to standards. And, and the idea is that when God isn't approached on his terms, whatever else we offer is unacceptable. Have you noticed if you're reading through the Bible and you get into Leviticus and you think, is this ever going to end? How, what could God possibly care whether there's four gold rings on the poles that carry the Ark of the Covenant or whether there's two on each side? Does it really matter that much? Four, two, who cares? Carry the thing. Is God just trying to wear people out? Is, is there something God is training this people to see in all of this? And there is. And what God's training them to see is, I will decide what's important when you approach to me. You won't decide. And of course, he's getting them ready for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him how do, you, how do you start to show people long before he arrives that God has to be approached on his terms? Well, the curtain has to be blue. Don't make it yellow. What if we make it yellow? I, I won't accept it. What's he doing? He's trying to teach people, by the way, we still have that disease in the church. It's alive and well. Worship is just a matter of the heart, Pastor Donna. This is how I'm comfortable worshiping. You ever hear people say that? Where on earth did we get the idea that our comfort is what determines how God is to be worshipped? It's not in your Old Testament. It's not in your New Testament. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from democratic process in the world around us. And we assume that it must apply to God as well. So people seeking to establish their own righteousness on their own terms. God has been reinforcing the truth in the opposite direction right from the beginning of the Bible. The issue isn't sincerity. The issue is only God's terms. Man's righteousness, his concepts of righteousness, his deeds of good works apart from Christ, will get him nowhere with God. This is the Bible's answer to the questions people have about the need for nice people to hear about Jesus and accept his grace and his lordship. Of course your unsaved neighbor is nice. He's polite. He's probably as nice as you. Maybe he's nicer than you are. He may give large sums of money to charity. He may hold his own beliefs about God and morality with great sincerity. But what is the nature of his acknowledgement of Christ? So leaving Christ out of the picture, that's eternally fatal. This is what Jesus was referring to in Matthew 23, that passage where he accuses the Pharisees, with all of their regulations, with all of their good works of being sons of those who killed the prophets. They claimed righteousness, but they never embraced the message of the prophets. What was the message of the prophets that the Pharisees rejected? What were all the prophets pointing to? Who were all the prophets pointing to? It was Jesus. When Jesus stands in front of the Pharisees, and they reject him got their own righteousness. I mentioned Paul talking about this in his own conversion story. You can read it in Philippians 3. There's five verses, 2 to 7. Really pretty blunt words from Paul. Again, like Jesus, Jesus was with snakes and Paul's talking about dogs Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. You know what he's talking about. People that just rely on circumcision. I've got, I've got my religion. Very devout. 
For we are the real circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. Put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law. There it is. Blameless. Nobody could find one thing that I didn't do perfectly under God's law. And he came to the place and he realized he was lost. Why? Jesus didn't see what God was doing in Christ. Whatever gain I had, I counted loss for the sake of Christ. That's what he means. So there's a kind of righteousness, a kind of outward, self-centered righteousness that is just totally contrary to God's will, counterproductive to holiness and Christ-likeness. Those dogs Paul talks about are the religious people piously working their way around the plain and simple reliance on Jesus Christ. That kind of blameless righteousness, the good works, the good deeds. Is it important for me to do good deeds? I agree. It's important to do good deeds. Good deeds that aren't fixed on and growing out of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Good deeds are as filthy rags before God. There's the rub. There's a kind of righteousness detached from Christ that is not only unfruitful, but any work of mine not rooted in devotion to Jesus is a work filled with pride. And so not only is it not helpful, it's destructive. The, the, the good things I do can be eternally damning if they aren't rooted in a relationship with Jesus Christ. That kind of righteousness needs to be forsaken. It needs to be forsaken. Maybe I can sum it up this way. We, we've studied for weeks in my Christian ed class, not all that long ago in the South Sanctuary. We went through the book of Galatians. And what I was saying in that class was every Christian needs to know there are, there are two ways, not one, Two ways to miss out on saving grace in Jesus Christ. One we know quite a bit about. The other we know less about. Here's how people miss God's grace in Jesus Christ. First, well, we break God's law. We do what we ought not to do. We sin. We lie. We're selfish, we don't love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We're greedy. You know how the list grows. We break the law in some way. We transgress. And the law offers no forgiveness, no grace. It just, you just break it, and you're guilty. Either in the pages of the Bible we see our guilt, or... God's inner law written on our own conscience until it becomes seared, but initially it lets us know guilt, guilt. But there's a second way to miss out on saving grace. And you can do it without ever being visibly immoral. It has to do with where you place your trust for acceptance with God. And now you start looking at the world's religion, you start looking at morally good people who are all over the place and why they need a redeemer. It has to do with, with the way we place our trust for acceptance with God by assembling, lining up the good deeds of my life, Oprah-like stuff. 
devotion to humanitarian efforts, kindness to the needy, the poor, your passion for keeping the outward ceremonies and rituals of some religion in the world. Whatever it is, you can perform these things vigorously. You can, you can perform these things sincerely and you can perform them spotlessly. And you can actually rely on the assembling of these things to create your ladder to heaven. And to the extent that anyone fails to turn to God's redemption in Christ, here's what happens with all of those good deeds, all of those good works, the avoidance of things that are bad and immoral, God's wrath remains on that person. John 3, 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. Did you notice what happened in that verse, 336? Do you have that in your notes? Look at it really carefully. Whoever, the second word is believes, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not, and you expect to see believe again, don't you? But you don't. And so what John is doing is he's trying to show us what real belief looks like. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But, but the wrath of God remains on him. This is one way the Bible talks about righteousness, never positively. There are two ways that it speaks about it positively. We're going to get to that. But when the Bible talks about training in righteousness, it's not talking about you cultivating the habits of being a nice person. It's not talking about that. That will destroy you. Let me tell you one quick story. We're a little bit ahead of schedule. I've shared this once before. So I'm speaking in a little town in Germany to a group of all of our denominational district leaders, uh, general superintendent, missionaries, Murray, there's this room, and there's maybe, I'll get this wrong, Rainey will correct me, there's maybe 40-ish in this room. And that's, uh, I was asked to present on a specific subject. Murray asked me and I fell for it. And I did it. Is the gospel losing its power to change lives was the topic. Go through the whole thing. And I had this, a little bit of what I talked about tonight. There's a couple I've known for years. And, and uh, she took offense at what I was presenting. And instead of coming up to me afterwards... And telling me, she, so I'm, I'm standing there, and there's this big table and chairs, and, and she goes, she goes, you know, I just feel this talk about judgment and wrath and God rejecting our righteousness. She said, I was just talking down the street with a group of young women, beautiful young women, and they don't need condemnation from us. They just need our love, she said. Now, they do need our love. She said, I was talking to these beautiful young women. So now the room went just like this. It was just quiet. And so I'm looking at Murray. He's looking at me. I'm looking at our general superintendent sitting at the end of the table. He's looking at me. And I said, I said, I don't, I don't, I don't know what the rules are here. You know, uh, I was asked to deal with this subject. But I said, I don't know what you mean when you say these beautiful women down the street. I said, I'm assuming you don't mean just physically gorgeous looking women. She goes, no, of course not. I mean inwardly. I said, well, I have a problem with that. 
The problem I have is twofold. Here's what the Bible says about those beautiful women that you were talking to. It says their hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. And it says that the wrath of God is on them every second of their lives. Until they get right with Jesus Christ. And the room stayed just like this. And then other questions came up and we talked. But here's, here's, here's what kind of rattled me. I thought two things. One, here's a, here's a, a couple uh, involved in ministry in, in very key visible ways. Missionary ways. And I'm thinking, why, why, why would you be doing what you're doing if you don't think people like those beautiful young ladies you were speaking to, that if you don't believe God's wrath is on them, why are we wasting all this money? Let's just go home. And the other thing that bugged me a bit was 38 other people who, who basically didn't say anything. This idea of righteousness... There's the imputed righteousness of Christ we'll look at next week. There are deeds of good faith in Christ Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit, that we'll look at next week. But apart from that, when the Bible talks about my own acts of righteousness separated from Jesus Christ, they will get me nowhere. They make me more guilty before God, not less guilty, because in every good deed done apart from Christ, I am rejecting God's plan of salvation. I am exercising bad will toward my creator. I am exercising unbelief in his assessment of what the need of my heart is. Does everybody see that? Self-righteousness. It is as eternally damning as immorality. Because both stem from a rejection of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, let's pray.